بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين First of all, uh, for all the brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And of course, uh, welcome to all non-Muslims here. I hope that there are a lot of non-Muslims today. I don't know, <laughs> it looks like uh, if most brothers and sisters are today Muslims. Because uh, we want to share with you this beautiful religion because we are convinced that this religion is a true religion. and. I, for myself, I was 10 years ago, I was a non-Muslim and I accepted Islam and I believe that this is the true way to God and the salvation in the hereafter. And therefore, I want to speak with you about a very important topic. We have to realize that we are all on a train. M Muslims, non-Muslims, men, women, we are all on a train and this train called life and every single person on this train has one day to depart he has to leave this train he will see a sign where he has to depart like cancer, heart attack, car accident, killed or whatever but every single person has to die and of course we all know this and Allah for example men mentioned this in a lot of verses in the Quran for example in Surah Ali Imran that the third chapter of the Quran in verse 185 he says Kullu nafsin that means Every soul will taste the death. And in Surah Ar-Rahman, it's the 55th chapter, in verse 26, he says, Kullu man alayha fan. That means, everyone on it, on the earth, will perish. And in Surah 56, verse 60, Allah says, Inna kadarna baynakumul maut. That means, we decreed death amongst you. And in Surah 62, verse 8, Allah says, Kul innal tafiruna minhu fa That means, speak, O Muhammad, say, Rarely, the death which you are fleeing from, he will surely meet you. Now, we ask ourselves, is there any human being in the world who believes that he will never die? I mean, did you ever meet somebody who says, no, no, I will never die? Is anybody here? Maybe somebody here who says he will never die? I mean, <laughs> I think maybe, uh, of course, there are some people insane, but every human being who is not crazy, he, he knows that he will one day die. So we ask ourselves, why is Allah, why is God mentioning these verses and other verses, more verses, where he mentions and remembers us that we will die? Because we know for sure, and this is very important for every Muslim, we know for sure that Allah will never tell us something or inform us uh, of something which is not beneficial for us or which is not important for us or which we don't need. Because Allah says in the Quran in Surah Taha, the 20th chapter, verse 2, we did not send the Quran to you, Muhammad, that you may be, that you be distressed, unhappy. So this is the guidance. The Quran is the guidance. Why is Allah mentioning that we will die and remembering us? And if you open the Quran, you will almost find on every page a mentioning of hellfire, paradise, Yom al Qiyamah, the day of resurrection, and so on. So why? So then we go back to the verse I just mentioned in chapter 62, verse 8, Surah al Jum'ah, where Allah says, Kul innal tafiruna minhu. The speak, where is the death you are fleeing from? So we ask, is it not that most human beings are like fleeing from death? 
and that they are living as if they will live forever. Is it not like this? You know, if we as human beings know that we will die one day, if we would, or if we really would realize and we really would implement this idea or this uh, fact, we would not act as we act. You know, and then I want to go one more back to this train. If I took a train from here, from Rotterdam to Amsterdam, how many hours do I need to arrive in Amsterdam? From here to Amsterdam, how many hours? One hour only? One? Not more? Okay. Look, imagine I would tell you today at 11 o'clock there are two trains from Rotterdam to Amsterdam. Two trains at the same time and they arrive at the same time in Amsterdam. And one train looks very good, very nice. And, and the other train does not look so good. But now you have a friend. And you know your friend, he's very intelligent, very honest, he never lies. And he loves the best for you. He's very concerned about you and your future. And your friend now tells you, look, Fatima, look, Mohammed, look, whatever your name is, don't take train, the, the train that looks good. Because this train that looks good, it's very bad. Because there's a poison in it, a gas. And if you afterwards, you arrive in Amsterdam, you will be ill for all your life. It's just an example, you know. Imagine, you know your friend tells it to you, you know. Would you say, yes, you know, but I like this train more, even if I have this risk, and even if you love me, and even if you love the best for me, and even if you never lie, I want to take the nice looking train. You will never do it, why? Because you would never risk for one hour in your life, you would, not, you would never risk the rest of all your life for one hour in your life on this train. So, dear Muslims, and also non-Muslims, we have somebody who loves the guidance for you more than your mother, and who never lied. And this is the Prophet Muhammad And the Prophet Muhammad he also mentioned for us that there are two trains that there are two trains. And he said, and in this hadith, he said, you know, not talking about the train, but, you know, it's an example. He says, حُجِبَتْ الْجَنَّةُ بِالْمَقَارِ وَحُجِبَتِ النَّارُ بِالشَّهَوَاتِ That means, the paradise is surrounded by the things that th seem to us unliked, disliked. For example, you know, we have to pray in the morning. If you now you have to wake up at, at 3 o'clock, for example, or 3.30, yes, it is something, you know, maybe you would like to sleep until 3 o'clock in, in the afternoon, you know. But you have to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's hot. It seems to be hot. And, you know, on the other side, and you have to pray, and you have to do, and you have to work, and so on. So it looks like these are things that are hard. It looks like if it is hard. On the other side, we have the other train. Surrounded, you know, the, 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 the na, hujibati naru bishahawat, that means the hellfire is surrounded by the shahawat, that means the lust, the desires. And it looks good, you know, making party, taking drugs, and, and so on, you know. And, but if you look now, where does it lead to? to hellfire. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you, no, the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, he is the one who loved the best for us. I want to mention it, we know it, but that we hear it one more time from the Quran. Allah said this in Surah Tawbah, the ninth chapter of the Quran, 128, in the verse 128, he said, min anfusikum." عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمٌ You know, that means, عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْكُمْ مَا عَنِتُّمْ That means, 
it is hard for him when you suffer. Harisun alaykum. He is concerned about you. That means he wants the best for you. And the Prophet Muhammad, even when a Jewish young boy was dying, he went to his deathbed that he accepts Islam because he didn't want that he will enter hellfire. So he invited him to Islam and alhamdulillah, this Jewish youngster, he accepted Islam. Now we go back to this train. We said nobody would risk for one hour drive all his life. Now let me tell you that this hour in your life, if you would take today a train from Rotterdam to Amsterdam, it is in relation to your whole life more than your he earthly life in relation to your life hereafter. Why? I mean, sometimes we don't realize it. Because the hereafter is not for 100 years and not for 1,000 years and not for 1 million years or 1 billion years. It's for eternity. And you can never come back to the train of life. When you die, it's over. And this is when you hear the Quran, when you see the Quran, this is mostly what the people say when they die, that they want to come back. Like in Surah Al-Mu'minun, the 23rd chapter, verse uh, 99 and 100, where Allah says, حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ هَدَهُمُ الْمَوْتُ قَالَ رَبِّ ارْجِعُونَ لِأَلِّي أَعْمَلُوا صَالِحًا فِي مَا تَرَقْتُ until the death comes to somebody, then he says, Oh Allah, bring me back. Bring me back one more time that I do good deeds. And Allah says, Kalla inna kalimatun huwa qailuha. No, this is just the word what he is saying. Why? Because you have 50 years, you have 60 years, and you see how many times you, somebody told you you have to pray. Why are you not praying? Why are you going to this school? Why you have a girlfriend and so on? But you are continuing. You are continuing. You're not stopping. So I ask you now, you know, if you would never risk your hereafter for one hour, your, your, your earthly life, the rest of your earthly life, for one hour trip, why we are risking our hereafter for this short period? And the Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, he gave us such a beautiful example. He said that the example of the earthly life, the life in the dunya, and the life hereafter, after death, is like somebody, he's standing in the, at the ocean. You have to imagine now, you're standing at the ocean, and he's putting his finger into the ocean. And he takes the finger out, and he says, the drop he has on his finger, it's earthly life, and the rest, the rest of the ocean is the hereafter. Imagine, for example, you go now to the North Sea, to Texel or whatever, no? And you're standing there with a cup and you want to empty the North Sea. Imagine, yeah, okay, if, if you see one, if some, imagine you go to somebody, he's doing like this, you say, hey, what are you doing all the time? I see you for one hour, you're doing like this. He said, yes, I want to empty the North Sea. They say, this guy's crazy, you know? If you come back after a thousand years, he's standing at the same spot. He's doing like this. He can't. And this is only the North Sea. It's not the Pacific. It's not, this is not uh, all the oceans. What does that mean? That means that this life is nothing in comparison to your life hereafter. So why you want to risk your life hereafter the ocean for this drop on your finger. You want to exchange the drop on your finger for your life hereafter. You want to ex exchange it? It's nonsense and something else. You know, when you want to drop on your finger, you will lose the ocean and you will lose the drop on your finger. Why? Because I told you the train which leads to hellfire, it just looks good. But inside of it, it's all, you find only destruction. I give you an example. If we ask about successful people, who is successful? 
For example, 20 years ago, if we would ask a young, uh, a young lady, who is your role model? Yeah, which person you would like to be like her? Which person? She would maybe say, yeah, you know, Whitney Houston. She's cool, you know. She has a nice voice always and so on, you know. Bodyguard, yeah. And, you know, but then you look 20 years later, where's Whitney Houston? Addicted to heroin. And so you see so many superstars, so many superstars, they are like this. You know, very, you see, they seem to be very successful, and this we have to realize. Success in life is not, you know, is, this is not about how many money do you have, how much money you have, or, or how, how, how much cars you have, but it's something in your heart. And Allah promised the believer in Surah Al Nahl, that's the 16th chapter of, chapter of the Quran, he, he promises us, he says, من عمل الصالح من ذكر أو أنثى وهو مؤمن فلا نوحينه حياة طيبة. That means whoever does good deeds, whether male or female, while he is a believer, we will cause him to live a good life. What is a good life? What is a good life? You know, what is this? This is something in your heart. And every human being finds in his life ups and downs. But how do you handle the downs? I give you an example. You know, there are people that are so rich and committing suicide. You know, in Germany, for example, all 48 minutes you have a suicide there. I think it, it's, it's maybe in, in Holland not, not less, or I don't know. Almost like this. How many people committing suicide? Why you have all this... Why you have all this money and the people are living quite good according to our mind. House and money and eating, drink and so on. You know, but at the same time you find people, if you ask somebody, what would be the worst situation you could be in? What would he say? He will maybe say to be disabled. That I cannot walk and not do anything. You know, one year ago, almost one year ago, I visited a brother, a Moroccan brother in Germany, in a hospital. He is uh, around 30 years old, and he's lying in the bed with a beard, and he cannot move his hands, and he cannot move his legs. He has like a stick in his mouth where he can call the doctor. I went into his room and he sees me and he knows my lectures, alhamdulillah, you know. And you know, I see his face bright with nur, we say, you know. And he's smiling. And I ask him, how are you? You know what he says? Wie geht's? Alles klar? Hmm? And he says, alhamdulillah. Praise be to God. You know, even in this situation, even in this situation, he is not, uh, you know, like losing hope. But he knows that Allah is testing him. And I know one guy, he got his child, came to the world and was ill. And he cried out of joy because he said that the prophet says, if Allah loves somebody, he will test him. And he said, maybe this is a sign that Allah loves me. You know? So what I want to say is that Islam gives you even hope in the worst situation. So, therefore I say, the Muslim has a happy life. And if he practices Islam, he gets the drop on the finger and the whole ocean. Alhamdulillah. So, when we think about this, that we all will die, and one of you, or of us, will be the next, maybe today, nobody here has, has a guarantee that he will live to get tomorrow. Nobody. Nobody. You know? Because, oh, I give you an example. 
A friend of mine, he was 24 years old. Alhamdulillah, practicing Muslim. And he was a sportsman, always playing football, running, and so on. One day, he came from football playing. And he said to his mother, he's Turkish, he said, I have some pain in my chest. And he said, I want to lay down a bit and I sleep a bit. And he opened Quran. He heard Quran. He didn't open uh, Umpul Thum or Shab Khalid or I don't know. Uh, what, what's else there, you know? Uh, Basta Rhymes, Bob Marley or whatever, you know? Loon. <laughs> <laughs> Fat man scoop, you know. <laughs> ah, this you know, yeah? Okay. It's a bit old. <laughs> no. He opened the Quran and he slept and from this sleep he never woke up. His heart did not beat anymore. So you have not a guarantee and I give you if you want the Iman kick for the Muslims. Go today to YouTube. I think most of you know YouTube, right? Okay. Go to YouTube and, give, and put in deadly accidents. Deadly accidents, look what happens. Somebody goes on the street and a car comes. Somebody is driving with his car on the highway. Suddenly on the other line, a truck comes over to him and hits him. What can you do? You go oh, today, you go back to your house, maybe a, you, you, you are driving at the green light and a truck comes from the, from the left side and hits you because he didn't see the red light. You never know. So if we really realize this, this will help us and this is important for us, first of all, that we make more good deeds. And secondly, that we do less bad deeds. And thirdly, that, you know, the remembrance of death is something which softens the heart. And fourth, it gives you more ikhlas, sincerity, in your deeds, because you think about your aim. You know you're, you're only living for a short moment. It's only a short moment, it's nothing. And then you are satisfied with less. You are satisfied with less because you know, I don't need this stuff. I don't need to be the best and to have most cars and have, and you know, why there is so much crime? Because people, they want the fast success. Yeah, I need a bit of money here, and about, no? So, he takes it. So when we, as Muslims, we have this, uh, this feeling that we know we are not from this world. Allah created for us the hereafter. This world is just a test. You know, we would be the people with the less criminal rate. But unfortunately, especially here in Europe, you know, you see how the Muslims act. You know this uh, Gerd Wilders, you know, he's always saying, yeah, look, the Muslims, how they're acting, they're saying like this and that. Yes, but you know, the problem is, the problem is, in this, you know, in some things he's right. That really a lot of Muslims are behaving very bad. You know, he sees like a Dutch guy, he says, hey, you uh, white, uh, filthy, whatever, pork eating, and so on. Of course, we as Muslims, we know that this is not the behavior of a Muslim. That this is a bad behavior. And therefore, you have an obligation. When you go back to your house, when you go back to your neighborhood, you have to tell these youngsters that this behavior is destroying the good picture of Islam. And that you are a bad example and a shame for Islam. This is our obligation. Because believe me, if we would act according to Islam, and if we would be satisfied with less, the Muslim neighborhoods would be the most clean neighborhoods, would be the, uh, the most secure neighborhoods, and the most beautiful neighborhoods. But unfortunately, here in Europe, at least in Germany, you know, when you go to Berlin or you go to Cologne, the neighborhoods where the Muslims live are the most dirty neighborhoods, the most uh, uh, criminal neighborhoods, you know, and why? Because we are not practicing Islam. But this is for all. If we believe that we are only living for a short distance, we are 
satisfied with less. And also like wars. Why happened wars? Because the people want more. More territory, more money, more oil, more whatever. So this is something what helps to establish peace on earth. Now, of course, some atheists will say, no, no, look, the religions are always the cause for, for war. That's not right. That's not right. It's more mostly about territory and about resources and not about religion. Yes? Then we have something else what is very important when we remember death and what we are here for a short period. We will repent soon. For example, if I tell you, really, I ask you, do you have a guarantee that you live tomorrow? You will say no. Do you have a guarantee that you live after one hour? You will say no. So I tell you, if I knew that you will die after one hour, or that you will die until tomorrow, would you pray today at night? Would you make the prayer today? Would you change your life? Of course, you would change your life, but you have to know that Ibn Omar said, فَإِذَا أَنْسَيْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَذِرَ الصَّبَحْ وَإِذَا أَصْبَحْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَذِرَ الْمَسَاء That means, if you reach the evening, don't expect the morning. Even if you reach the morning, don't expect the evening. So, you, we have to prepare, and I hope, I want to say it like right now, that everybody now thinks about what he has to, in which thing he has to improve. Like Umar al-Khattab said, حَاسِبُ أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَن تُحَاسَبُ That means that you have to look at yourself, where are your mistakes, where I have to change. And therefore, I hope that everybody who is not praying will go back today to his house, and say, I will start today. And every woman who is not wearing hijab says, I will start today. No matter work or whatever, I have one God and he will help me. And that every man who has a girlfriend quits his relationship. <laughs> if he has a girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, you know, the problem is, the problem is, you know, Achi, this, you know, girlfriend, this is a, you know, I didn't talk about uh, women and boyfriends. Of course, there are also women who have boyfriends. But, you know, everybody knows in, 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 in the Muslim society, this is something bad. But, you know, the boy, no problem. He has one girlfriend, next week the next girlfriend. No problem. As a boy, he's young, you know, he needs some time. It's like, is it, it's often like this, you know. Subhanallah, you know, one time I met a guy. He's also Moroccan from Germany. And... <laughs> Look, you know, you know what he said? He said to me, you know what? You know, I'm a good Muslim, you know, I'm believing, I'm praying. I have only one small mistake. Small. Women. Small mistake? Is it for your sister a small mistake? For your mother a small mistake? Small mistake. You know, then he said, you know, it's, a, it's something in German. Maybe I tell it to you because the uh, Dutch, the, Holland, the people in Holland almost understand everything in German. He said, and for this I have one day, I have to, uh, in front of Allah, muss ich mich gerade machen. Gerade machen. That means, you know, normally gerade machen, that means like, you know, I think this guy has to do uh, things he has to do with a bouncer in a nightclub, you know? Like, you know, gerade machen. That's like, hey, what's your problem? Uh, you know, like this, you know? <laughs> you know, it's really unbelievable. But this is our attitude to the religion. So as I told you, quit your relationship with your girlfriend, if you have one. Okay? And also boyfriend, if there is a boyfriend. Yes, that's the way. Okay, now you say, yeah, it's hard, you know, you know... Um, you know, I have a job and we see job and all people are looking at me. Achi, you're living here in Holland. What's the problem? You know, in Germany, really, you know, I realized the difference. I was yesterday in Ramon, today in Rotterdam. You know, when I go in Germany like this, you know, everybody's looking like this. <laughs> you know, here, you go to, you go to a gas station. First of all, you think, oh, mm, what's that? You know, what is this? 
and you go and say, uh, uh, not Salam Alaikum, yes, uh, golden avant, uh, uh, or you say, uh, good evening, yes, how much this, that, yeah, thank you. Then you say, oh, yeah, this guy, this guy, you know. In Germany, in Germany, when you go like this, not all, of course, you know, but you think, ah, oh, he's so nice because he has another plan, you know, he's there, <laughs> Why is so nice? You know, yeah, you're living here, no problem, alhamdulillah. Look, you know, this is our advantage. Therefore, we have to change ourselves today. Now I give you something else. How many minutes left? <laughs> Because I want to give you something else. The importance of remembering hereafter. 15? Very good, no problem. <laughs> Look, yes, because I always go to Germany and Holland and everywhere. Look, if we think about the verse in the Quran about the hereafter, or I come with another example. If you go to school or to university, yes, who is the best teacher for you? Or if you go, you're playing soccer, football, who is the best trainer? It's not the best trainer, I don't want a name, I want a characteristic, an attribute. It's not the best teacher, the one who prepares you good for what will come. It's not the best, you know, if you enter the test in school and, you know, all these things you have to do, you know, all this wajibat, you know, number, uh, question number one, question number two, question number three, you never hear something about it. Is this a good teacher? No, a good teacher is somebody who prepares you well for this test. And a good teacher is somebody who motivates you for the school. That he gives you like a vision. If you are good in school, then afterwards you can have a good job, and afterwards you can have good money, and so on. This is a good teacher. So, if every human being knows that he will be here shorter than in his year after. Even if you ask a non-Muslim, will you be longer death or longer life? He will of course say, I will be longer death, or at least not live on this world. Because if you go to a graveyard right now, graveyard, and you look at the signs there, you will see that a lot of them are longer death than they even lived right now. So, what must a good teacher do for this life? This, this life is a school. And the best teacher is the one who prepares you for the hereafter, who motivates you. And therefore, we see in the Quran all the details about death. What will happen when the angels take the soul? What will happen in the grave? What will happen at the day of resurrection? What will happen if you committed this sin? What will happen if you committed that sin? What will happen in paradise? Can you have children in paradise? Will there, in paradise, uh, 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 will there be animals? And this and that. What happens in, in hell? There is no book detailed as detailed as the Quran on this topic. And there is no messenger, no messenger talked about this topic as the messenger Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. So this is for me a proof that the Prophet Muhammad is the best teacher. And therefore that his message and that the Quran is the best book to teach you about this. And this is the proof for me that, one proof, no? there are thousands of proofs, of proofs that Islam is a true religion. And now I want to give you one example, one verse from the Bible. And of course, when we cite the Bible, we have to be careful. First of all, because Quran tells us that there are interpolations and changes in the Bible. Allah says, for example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 79, Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say, this is from God to receive a cheap price with it. No? Then, and the Bible also Uh, supports this fact, for example, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 8, verse 8. 
So if we find something in the Bible, there are three possibilities. First of all, it contradicts something in the Quran, then we say this is a, something wrong, something changed. For example, in Genesis 32, it's written that God wrestled with Jacob, Jacob and lost. So we as Muslims say that's impossible because Allah has power over everything and you know this is just not from his characteristics an absolute impossible because Allah is nobody can beat him subhanallah then you know these are the first verses which contradict the Quran the second are verses which support the Quran we accept these verses and the third are verses we don't know there we say I don't know it doesn't support Allahu Alam. This is what the Prophet said. He said, لا تكذبوا أهل الكتاب ولا تصدقون ولكن كولوا آمنا بالله وما أنزل Don't say to the Christian and Jews you lied and don't believe them. That we are talking about the book, not about a, a relationship in, in other things, you know. But say we believe in God and what was revealed to us. So in the Bible, in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 12. It's written that Jesus said to his followers when he wanted to depart, I have much more to say to you, but you cannot bear it now. That's the first part. Okay? I have much more to say to you, but you cannot bear it now. But when the Spirit of Truth comes, he will teach you all the truth. That's the best teacher, the spirit of truth. You'll later see who is the spirit of truth. Is. And he will not speak from his own inclinations, but he will speak only what he hears. This characteristic. So here we see, first of all, Jesus commits that he didn't show them everything and that he didn't complete the religion. And this is something which supports Islamic teachings which we find in Islamic teachings. For example, in chapter uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 3, Allah says, That means, today I have completed your religion. So the religion was completed with who? With the Prophet Muhammad, Then, you know, he says, But when the one after me comes, the spirit of truth, and spirit of truth, the, the word in Greek here is, is what... People told me, I cannot speak Greek, is Paraklutos, you know, spirit of truth. And we know the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament, Codex Sinaiticus, called, they are from the fourth century after Jesus, 400 years. And we say it, it can fast happen some changes in letters. Paraklutos, Periklutos, Paraklutos, Periklutos. What does Periklutos mean? Periklutos means. Somebody who is praised and who praises a lot. And what does this mean in Arabic? What does it mean somebody who is praised? What is this in Arabic? Muhammad. And who is somebody who praises a lot in Arabic? Ahmed. And these are both names of the Prophet Muhammad And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Saf, chapter 61, verse uh, 6, that Jesus said, And giving glad tidings, that Jesus is giving glad tidings, of a messenger who comes after me, and his name will be Ahmed. So this is, subhanallah. Then we go, what does he say afterwards? And he will not speak from his own inclinations, but he will speak what he, what he, hear, what he hears. What do we find in chapter 53, verse 3 and 4? He does not speak, Muhammad does not speak from his own inclinations and desires, and desires, but what he says is a revealed revelation. So I say, these details in the Bible, uh, these details in the Quran are supporting evidence that Islam is a true religion. And therefore, for we shouldn't use it. Then the third thing, 
why it's so important to know these verses about hellfire, about paradise, if, is, you know, in the da'wah. If we want to invite to Islam, and, and I want first to say something, you know, I'm very happy to be here today with you and to share with you some, uh, for some of my limited knowledge, but I also want that we all improve, you know. Normally, you should use these opportunities to invite people to Islam. You have to ask yourself, you know, did you ask, for example, your neighbor, your classmate, your friend, your whatever? Yeah, maybe, maybe you know, non-Muslim, you know, non-Muslim, like, uh, you know, say, yeah, you know this guy, you know this uh, musician, this rapper Loon, you know, he, he will come to Rotterdam, he come with me, and he's talking, he accepted Islam. Maybe she's very curious. Yeah, really? You accept Islam? Why? You know, I want to see it. And there's also one guy, you know, from Germany, you know, yeah, he was a boxer before. Then, better don't say it. Then they say, yeah, yeah, boxer, boxer, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> too much, uh, too much, too much hits, you know. <laughs> too much hits. Yeah, yeah. Look, so leave it with Loon, <laughs> inshallah. You know. Look, but this is an opportunity. We have to spread this message. We believe that one who dies without Islam will go to hellfire. So we cannot say, you know, if you see somebody falling down, he will say, hey, stop. So we have to try to, to explain to the people Islam. That's very important. And I tell you, unfortunately, a lot of people, they think like the da'wah is something for the ulama. That's not right. That's absolutely wrong, unfortunately. No, this is for you and for me and for everybody. Every Muslim can invite to Islam. How? I don't, I'm not talking about giving a lecture about a, 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 a hard topic or whatever. I'm talking about giving somebody a booklet, talking to somebody, go with him to the mosque. This is very important. Unfortunately, some people say, yeah, you know, don't talk with the non-Muslims about hellfire and paradise. They don't like it. First of all, you know, there are always some things people don't like, but they are the truth. And the Prophet Muhammad, when he went to Taif, 60 kilometers by feet, and he stayed there 10 days, going from door to door, inviting the people to Islam, what did they do? They tried to kill him. They, tr they threw stones at him until his blood, he was bleeding everywhere on his body. Did they like what he talked with them about? No. So it's not about what you like, it's about the truth. And the truth is sometimes unliked. You know, and here we have to think, you know, some people say, don't talk about hereafter. That's wrong. According to Quran, according to Sunnah, according to logic, and according to experience. Quran, first of all, Allah says in chapter 36, Surah Al Yasin, verse 69 and 70. In wa Quran hayya. That means this is a message and a clear Quran that you warn those who are alive. Warn those who are alive with the Quran. Open the Quran on every page you find hellfire. Secondly, the Sunnah. What did the Prophet say? When he went to Jebel Safa, to the Mount Safa, and he asked the people to come to him, he said, you know, I'm a, I'm a clear warner for a severe punishment. I warn you a severe punishment. Third logic. Imagine you are non-Muslim. I, I was non-Muslim. Somebody tells you now, you know, um, I want the best for you and I give you this booklet about Islam and I would, would really appreciate if you read this booklet because I want the best for you and I believe that Islam is the only true way to salvation. What will be his first, what will he think about? He will think, what is if he is right? What is if he is right? You know? Then fourth, the experience, I tell you one story. One time, I went to a lecture, and there was a, you know, I, I talked about Islam and terrorism, 
And then I got a letter. A woman wrote, yes, you know, I, uh, I want, I'm non-Muslim, I want to accept Islam, but I have some problems and this and that. I looked like this to the woman, and I saw one woman, and I immediately thought she is the one she wants to accept Islam. I don't know, I, sometimes I smell it, you know. <laughs> we, we, it's really like this, you know. So I went out for the, for the break, and then a Moroccan guy came to, Moroccan guy came to me, <laughs> and he said, hey, look, they are this. She was around 20 years old. You know, this 20-year-old um, girl, she is very close to Islam, you know, just, you have just to talk to her. So I went to her, I said, yes, uh, can I maybe help you, you know, because I heard you want to accept Islam. She was a bit nervous, yeah, um, yes, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, but, and she said, yes, you know, uh, I'm really convinced that Islam is the truth, but I first want to inform my parents. So I said, First of all, it's no condition to inform your parents. And do you think you go to your parents and say, yeah, mama, daddy, mommy, I want to accept Islam. They say, oh, that's nice, man. Here you get a hijab, very good. Uh, and maybe in your car, you can wear it. You know? No. They will, they will say, what? You want to accept Islam? All these criminals, terrorists, and whatever. OK. She left. You know, she left. Yeah, yeah you were right. You know? So she said, Yes, but, you know, I don't want to make any mistakes because, you know, uh, I don't know how to pray and so on. I said, look, you have first to take the first step. You know, it's like a baby. A baby, you cannot take a baby and it jumps trampoline, you know. It's, it's trampoline. It's, it's impossible. The baby has first to go like this and, you know, and first it has to sit, then it has to go like this and then it runs a bit and falls down and then you can make a marathon with the baby sometimes, you know? So, you have first to take the first step, accept Islam. There's nothing between you and Islam. But if you go out and you die, then you will be in hellfire. So what is, so she accepted Islam, alhamdulillah. Afterwards, she told us a story how she accepted Islam. Look, unbelievable. She was in the disco, nightclub, you know, <laughs> dancing. And they came in the nightclub, and she met in the nightclub a Moroccan <laughs> youngster. <laughs> it's a brother of him, it's his brother, you know? And she, she drank a bit alcohol, normal, you know? It's, it's normal in, in Germany and Holland, and, you know? And uh, she didn't know how to come back to her home. So she asked this Moroccan guy, can you maybe bring me to my house? You know, I don't know, I have no car, my friends went, uh, leave, and so on. He said, okay, no problem. So in the car, they talked about Islam. <laughs> MashaAllah. <laughs> Better than nothing, right? And he said, you know, and then she, he said, yes, you know, I don't drink alcohol, I'm a Muslim. MashaAllah. Better than nothing, you know, okay, you're in the disco, but you don't drink alcohol. Better than nothing, you know. So then he said, and we believe that those who die without accepting Islam will go for eternity to hellfire. You know what she said? I don't, I don't want to go to hellfire. So he told her, so raise your hands to heaven and ask God to guide you. She said, I did this in this night and the next day, the next morning, I woke up, I wanted to know about Islam. I had not the phone number of this guy, nothing. I didn't know, where, where do I get information from? So she went to the city of this guy and went from place to place and asked for him because she didn't know where to get information of Islam from. So she found him and he made the arrangement with his sister and at the end, alhamdulillah, she accepted Islam. But what was the first step? that he mentioned hellfire. Another friend of mine, you know, he read a book, he's an engineer in Germany, he read a book about hellfire, and it just entered his heart that this is the truth. You know, it entered his heart because Islam is a deen of the fitrah, natural inclination. And I can tell you a lot of stories, alhamdulillah, you know, but I think I don't have a lot of time, you know, yet. It's not 
not much here, but okay, not much time yet. But what I want to say, if here are non-Muslims today, you know, I want to ask you, do you believe, you know, answer this in your heart. Do you believe that there's only one creator and that this creator is whether is not a male and not female, he's God, without any, any uh, 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 you know, over our uh, comprehension. We cannot, we cannot make a picture of God. Do you believe this? And do you believe that this God is the only one who has the right to be worshipped? If you believe this, you have in your heart the first part of the declaration of faith. That means in Arabic, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. And do you believe that Muhammad came with the Quran from Almighty God and that the Quran is the truth and that Muhammad is a true messenger of Almighty God and the final message of Almighty God? If you believe this, you know, actually you have just to testify it with your tongue. Is anybody here who believes this? from the non-Muslims. If there's anybody, you know, you can... <laughs> Waste your hands, you know. Yes, maybe you're afraid a bit, you know. Maybe you hear that I'm a boxer and so on. <laughs> if anybody is here, you know, think about it. And even if you don't know, if you're unsure, I give you a advice, like this young woman. When you go home today, waste your hands. Don't do like this or like that. No prophet in the Bible did like this. Jeremiah in the Bible did like that. And Jesus, according to the Bible, you can write it down and look in your Bible. Matthew 26, verse 39, he prayed like this. With his face on the ground. Pray like this to God and say to him, O Almighty God, show me the true way. And for the Muslims, change yourself today. And if you go home, one thing else, please make dua for me, that Allah gives me sincerity. And next time when we come to, I hope, you know, I, I know I want to ple uh, <laughs> work a bit here in the Netherlands, inshallah. You know, I hope that you all bring one non-Muslim with you to such, to such uh, events, inshallah. Because this is important. We love the best for the people and we have an obligation. Our, we have an obligation to spread this religion, you know. That's my words. Everything what was right was from Allah alone and everything what was wrong was from my soul and from shaitan. Therefore I say, Subhanaka wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illand, astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk. And peace. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, yeah.